Excellent. Let's talk about failure. Take it from the 10,000 sort of foot view, right? We all have experienced it. It's caused some of us health problems. Um, uh, you know, the nauseous feeling, uh, I I'm always fascinated by, by the fact that, you know, when it's coming and waking up at about three in the morning, uh, and, and, and sort of with a, with a, with a upset stomach, knowing the failure's coming and trying maybe to, to put it off for a little while or do whatever you can to avoid it. But, you know, sort of deep down in your soul that it's, uh, that it's right around the corner. Um, and it's, it's always hard to let go, hard to admit all that stuff. But um, I want to, we have the, the conference, this, this session is called I Failed Now What? So let's take this first part to focus on the concept of I failed and ownership. And talk to me a little bit from a 10,000 foot level on the role that you feel like failure has played in the trajectory of your career and your work. Yeah, I can start. I mean, I think for me, it's been uh, fundamental. I think, you know, I got into entrepreneurship and business really through accident. So I went into it really, really naive. I also went into it really, really young uh, in starting my first company. So, you know, I was still, you know, I had just graduated from college. I was still living at home with my parents, you know wasn't married, didn't have any, didn't have any uh, kids. Uh, I was 22 years old. So the idea of failure, um, you know, was there, but it wasn't something that was, you know, you know consuming, you know, and as Chris to say as being, you know, an eternal optimist, I just figured, you know, I'd, I'd figure things out and, and make it work. You know, when I when I hear the word failure, there's also like various levels of failure. Um, you know, what you know, you're can be alluding to, Mike, around you know more of that you know, catastrophic failure of an entire business failing versus um, kind of these micro failures of you know you're experiencing kind of day in and day out of, of running a company um, are, are are two things. So I think you know as I look at the kind of failure as just a general topic, um, failure as I encounter it kind of on a day in day out basis. It's very much, you know, what am I learning? How am I growing? Um, how am I adapting and changing based off of where I'm not seeing success, where I might be seeing failure? Um, so for me personally, um, you know, that's really how um, I look at failure is how am I learning from it? How am I growing from it? Um, and then also just not beating myself up about it and um, really embracing the idea of, of, of failure. There's a lot that we can't control. What can we control? And, you know, even with my team, letting them know that, um, you know, we embrace, we embrace failure from a standpoint of wanting to learn from it and grow. Uh, but, um, you know, we also, it's not, it's not a goal to fail either, right? It's a goal to succeed, but failure comes with that just naturally. So, um, that, that's what I would say really about failure and, and, and how I look at that from kind of a 10,000 foot view. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a fascinating point that there are sort of these, these micro failures that happen sort of on a, on your more granular level on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's sort of the, the catastrophic project level or business level failure to that, that I think we've all experienced. Certainly I have that becomes almost sort of DNA altering and forces you to kind of shift your focus and shift your, your paradigms, how you think about things and all that stuff. So I, I think that's an interesting concept that you, that you brought up, Colin, that, that, it's, that, that it's dealing with those daily failures and then the, the larger failures as a whole and how you, the systems that you have to deal with both of those are, uh, are quite different. Mm -hmm. So Jean, quest, same question to you about the role failures played in the trajectory of your career? Well, the thing is that, you know, and this is Jihan, by the way. Uh, so, um, you know, when I look at the failure, you know, like as startup founders or the founders of companies or entrepreneurs, like we never start anything with the idea that we will fail. But most of the time we start things with 20% knowledge, 80% we don't know, let's, 
figure it out uh, process. And so if you know 20% and then every day you need to execute and you cannot say, oh yeah, I, you know, there's this decision to be made. Uh, should I make it or not? You know, the nut is doing nothing. And if you don't do nothing in your small startup, nothing w- goes forward because there's no other person does it for you. So that's the thing like you, every day you need to execute something. Every day you need to push the, you know, envelope forward. And so we do lots of decisions and small er- er- errors we make, small failures happen, but the quicker you learn from them, and I think the, you know, the, the better it gets. Because I think the worst thing for us as the founders is, you know, stuck with the idea that I don't want to fail and I need to think about so much and then I don't want to execute. And if you go to that place, it's very hard to come back from it. And so, and I think, I think that's the, you know, reason like we like to, we make mistakes and, and they are fine. Like Colin said, you know, we learn from them. You know, like my last business failure, like happened several years ago. You know, I just became a partner in a uh, substance use disorder clinic, totally out of my realm. And, but, you know, with the idea that why not, you know, I will learn something. And I learned lots of things during the process and totally selected wrong partners. It turned into a very, very nasty partner's relationship. And, but in the meantime, you know, I met lots of great people and in recovery and stuff. And I learned, you know, like AA principles and, you know, lots of things change in mind. What happened is it triggered a hum- human-centered transformation in me. And I said, you know, I think I need to slow down. I think to, I need to build better relationships. I need to connect to people. I need to get the idea of, you know, like in people that in recovery knows uh, I need to surrender the outcomes, so I don't do anything related to outcomes anymore. I do it, and I say, you know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And in that way, I don't manipulate people anymore. And so it totally opened up, you know, new things for me. So the, it was a failure three years ago. It was a tough process for me to, you know, handle. But I come out of it. Now, when I look at it, I call it like a kind of a blessing. And so, because, you know, I learned, I did reflections, it was hurt a lot, and, but at the same time, you know, and if you have that growth mindset and saying that, you know, things happen to us, you know, we learn from them and go for the next, and, you know, life is beautiful, and the failures can open new doors to you, and, you know, I see it so many times, and this happened like a couple of years ago, so this is not like happened to me 25 years ago. And then I know that, you know, I will continue doing startups and I will continue to fail. But at the same time, the beauty of it is, you know, every startup is a new journey and every journey comes with a new adventure and new relationships. And I think it's beautiful. Chris, to you and that red background. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, I'm Chris. Uh, the... You know, for me, and not to make this a conversation about sobriety, but, you know, I'm, I'm sober now uh, from alcohol about a little over four years. Most of my professional life, I drink pretty heavily. And, and so what I found is that uh, drinking was a way for, for me to really avoid that fear of failure. And every, we all have it, whether it's, a, whether it's a alcohol or, you know, food or, or sex or even over exercising whatever that is and sometimes it's just other projects that are just completely distracting and uh, or a complete distraction and it's not it's not what you should be focusing on and that's typically a, for me anyway the sign that you know failure is is you know around the corner potentially um once i got once i got sober i realized like i haven't actually been fearless this entire time you know, and, and I've done a whole bunch of things. I, I, I take some big risks and, and usually win in a big way, quote unquote. And if I do fail, I, I kind of dealt with it and moved on. Just what, I guess, you know, that happened. What's next? What are we going to do now? Let's try that again. Let's try something diff- different. But I realized that I wasn't ever actually addressing the, the, the failure or the fear of failing at all. I was just simply, you know, masking it or avoiding the fear. Um, and so when I quit, you know, drinking or that that thing I was doing, uh, whether it's drinking or something else, 
I realized that I never really addressed those things. So I had to kind of, you know, start learning how to be an adult and, uh, and actually face that fear. And it was, you know, the very powerful experience to go through for me. And I learned a lot about myself, but I challenge, you know, people, whether it's, uh, whether you have a, a drinking problem or something completely different, it might not be something you're aware of is what, what, what happens right before that failure or what are you doing to, you know, to avoid the fear of failing. And it might even be something that seems fearless um, as, a, as a mask uh, so that you avoid that immediate, that immediate fear. For me, it's, it's a uh, long, slow failure is, is the worst. Um, and so I'm, tr I try to, uh, I'm trying now, especially to understand what happens to learn quickly and then figure out what I need to do to address that again and, and try something new. So talk a little bit about that. By the way, long, slow failure is going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> 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 um, um, talk about a little bit about Chris, that, that in your, in, in your business specifically in the sobriety space, um, how does addressing failure, how does addressing, and maybe you just did in that, in what you just said, uh, but expound a little bit more about that, the concept of failure inside that space specifically. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really interesting I, to me. It, it, um, I think a lot of people will, will approach sobriety uh, with a fear that they wouldn't, that they won't be able to do it. And sometimes it doesn't work, you know, and sometimes you, you have some struggle, you pop in and pop out and it's just, it's not like you, you're quit and you're done. Um, and some people just try to moderate and, and that's great for them and that's fine. Um, but I think there's this, the, you know, fear is at the core, I think, of this uh, it, of avoiding um, and of, of not being able to, uh, to address, you know, failure, whether it's, you know, looming or, or something that you just experienced. And uh, I think a lot of people won't start uh, the process of even getting sober uh, out of the fear that they're not going to be able to do it or it's too hard or I don't want to quit, you know, completely. I mean, you mean I'll never have a drink again? So um, that's how I kind of look at it. And just try, you know, is, is kind of the way that, uh, that I approached it. Yeah, that's, I think that's interesting. Um, Ed Catmull in his book, uh, Creativity Inc., um, Ed Catmull was one of the founding members of the Pixar studio. He talks a lot about failure in that specific book, um, specifically about the concept of decoupling uh, uh, failure and and uh, uh, the fear, mm -hmm. because we as, as we're growing up, we're taught to fail as something to be feared. We fail our parents. We fail in doing our chores. We fail at this. Then there is repercussions to that. Um, he talks a lot about if you can decouple those things and instead look upon in, in, in sort of team processes, um, look upon failures as just steps along the road um, to a final product. And we kind of decouple that concept of fear uh, away from failure. Um, and we, I guess, for lack of a better term, sort of embrace the concept of failure or failing up or any of those kind of buzzwords that you find in, in corporate culture sometimes. Um, but I wonder, Colin, what your kind of thoughts are on that concept of decoupling those two things. Yeah. Um, what I find is really interesting is that, um, you know, as, as human beings, we all have fears. Uh, I, I think as, as human beings, the way that those fears relate to failure can be so different from one person to the next, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I think, you know, to Chris's point, like a lot of what we're talking about today is is – psychology. It is understanding your own thoughts. It is understanding your own behaviors. Um, you know, why, why are you scared to fail? You know, what are those fears? Breaking down what those fears are, kind of, to your point, Mike, decoupling that. And then, you know, failure has these implications, um, and you can break those scenarios out. Uh, and then fear um, is really more of that, those personal feelings that you have. You know, these are my fears, uh, the, and, uh, I, you know, for what I think is just really amazing is just the way that we're all built um, so differently and how, you know, our fears 
um, can be so heightened for one person about a particular fear and, and so much lowered for another person just based off of could be the chemical structure or, the, or their upbringing or their own life experiences. Um, so I think to me what, what really helps in um, kind of breaking down, um, especially you know, the, the, the fear part, um, is almost creating like that personal life philosophy of like, what do you hold on to to help you understand you know, your fears and then to get over your fears? So I think you have to get over your, your fears first to you know, Jihan's point about like, um, uh, you know, getting, getting started and actually doing something. You have to get over your fear. Um, you know, you, you could be a failure by just not starting, sure. But really what we're talking about is you actually started something and you failed at it, right? The business didn't go the way that you thought it would. Even to get to that point, you have to get over a lot of fears. So kudos to everybody that's on this call that even got yeah. to building something, even if it didn't work out the way that you wanted. So I think, you know, for me personally, what I get over a lot of my fear on, and I, we talked about this when we were prepping for the session, which is deeply personally philosophical for me, which is, you know, I have one life and I only have so much time in this life and I want to live my life to the max and get what I can out of it. Um, and like having that pressure around like trying to do what I can to live a really rich meaning and fulfilling life um, really lowers the fear for someone like me that I'm typically pretty high strung, you know, I can have high anxiety, things like that, but I can get over a lot of those fears to do these businesses um, and accept failure because I, I understand more of my personal life philosophy and the meaningfulness that um, trying things and um, knowing that I may fail, but that I'll get up again and keep going because, um, you know, I have just this one life to live and I want to get what I can out of it. And I think that I think that's extraordinarily important because like when you're talking there, you know, you realize that the fear of failure is something that is ingrained in us from childhood. Yep. So, and we're all, all of us on this call, all of us are products of our past traumas, whatever they are, you know, whatever. And, 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 and it's, uh, you sort of have to unpack that stuff about yourself and realize what you're bringing in any given situation, because I still hear my father's voice in the back of my head, uh, when I'm making a decision about don't fail, don't screw this up, you know, that sort of thing. We all have that, um, or, or some version of that. Um, so finding a way to fail, finding a way to, I think, accept it as a part of a creative process, as a part of any process, as a part of any building process. Um, because the reality is, and this is what, what Ed Catmull says in his book, the reality is most of the time we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. So it's best just to get it over with, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and get there quickly, get to the failure point quickly. So, um, Talk about that a little bit, Jihan, in your experience, sort of get that concept of getting to it quickly, getting over the hump um, and, and moving through it. Yeah, well, I totally agree with you. Uh, before I jump in there, you know, I'm looking at some of the comments there and, you know, and I think one of the comments really, you know, hit me hard. It's talk, it says that uh, the couple failure and self-worth. And I think the self-worth thing is important because one of the things comes from our childhood, from our parents is, like you know self-consciousness and you know i remember my parents like still they are like you know what the neighbors say what the friends say what this say what that say so what you do is you live your life with what other people say whatever people look at you and you know i really want to you know uh, print these t-shirts and it will say i'm imperfect and i'm loving it and i and i'm fucking hate uh, being self-conscious i don't care what you think about me i don't care what you see I live my life as my identity and I'm not fighting against it. This is me. If you don't like it, don't look at me. Don't engage with me. I think if we have an, you know, a personal level understanding about that and say, I don't want to build fuck it list in life, but I will use fuck it all the time. I think it will make us, you know, way, you know, uh, action oriented people. I think we'll be more happier as human beings. And then people, and we will be free from all these, you know, uh, chains that people, you know, put on our legs, on our feet, on our arms. And, and then we can jump in and start, you know, executing, starting businesses. 
you know, or, you know, saying that I will be a triathlon athlete. So it's not about being a, you know, startup founder. You know, you can do lots of things. You can say, you know, I will be the, you know, uh, run 10 marathons and I will win all of them. And maybe you never run in your life. And maybe you will, you know, fail miserably first two years, but you will make it. And so the, the thing is, that I think if you get out for all those, you know, uh, chains and stuff that people and other people put us, and, and we say that I'm imperfect and I'm fine with it, I'm loving it, and, and I will go after things that I like to do in life, and, and then you start doing them. And like I said, we most of the time start things with 20% information. And so whatever we do learning, when most of the things we do will be failures. But if you say them, you know, they are like learning experiences, you don't even call them failures anymore. It's part of the process. And if this is the part of the process, you know, you will do it and continue. And you never feel like it's a failure. Like, you know, always, you know, we give examples from Thomas Edison. But he was right about it. Like he was learning 10,000 different ways of not making a ball. And, and if you think about that way, I think the life is beautiful. Then everything that you experience is not a failure. It's something you learn. So. I think we're looking at a comment. Uh, I'm looking at the comments here as well. By the way, that would be one huge T-shirt. Uh, I don't know. I was just thinking. Ended. Yeah. That'd be like, <laughs> what size is that? Yeah. That's, <laughs> um, That's awesome. It would be, it it would be like, a dress uh, yeah, shirt, Mary, pants. The, the Mary Tucker says the more everyone talks about their failures, how they learn from it, it becomes the norm. I think that that's the point of this session. I think that a lot of times, in my experience, it's everybody, there are a lot of people that are out there saying, you know, everything's great, everything's perfect, it's all, you know, um, as opposed to, I think we could learn much more from each other as founders, um, as startup founders, by just opening up, opening our chests a little bit and being honest with what's going on. You know, uh, I, they, there's, I feel like you expend so much energy during the process, during the, uh, the, especially when you accept the fact that, that failure is inevitable, you're going to try to put it off for a little while, but you're going to fail. You expend so much energy trying to look like you're not failing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to not look like you're, you're going through something. Whereas I feel like it'd be much healthier and much more helpful for everybody else to be like, yeah, that's, I'm a fucking mess. This whole thing's falling apart. Can somebody help me? Um, uh, you know, so I, I think that's an important piece of why sessions like this are important, um, because the more we can be sort of honest with each other, the better. Agreed. That's my rant. I'm off my soapbox now. No, I, 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 I just I also know. wanted to add, to, you know, that, so there's a, uh, a question, how, how to get along with those around you that are risk averse. I think there's something really important about finding people that are that are very different from you as well. And you can you can you can also that can help actually help you avoid failure um, because of trying you know it's the trying different ways of doing things um, I think there's a you have to trust your partners or the people that you you, you bring in and, and the, the team that you build and um, and trust that they're gonna do what they need to do and and sometimes it doesn't work out but you know that that's what what where trust comes in and I think that um, people who are risk averse can have can add a lot of value because th there might be some people who are are literally just every time they're just going to go for it and they're completely blind to actual risks that are there and the things that you know maybe they should should consider there there's some balance that that adds you know and entrepreneurship there's nothing I, I think we've all said this but John you you, you said it uh, the last time very well it's like there's nothing in the middle that's it's just either extreme up here or extreme. Maybe that was you, Mike. I don't remember, <laughs> but it's just one or the other yeah. extreme low extreme highs. And so it's, there's it's really the, not a lot of balance. It's the narcotic effect of entrepreneurship. Yes. It's super exactly. awesome or super crappy. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, especially in the startup world, you know, uh, I think that's what keeps us coming back too. And Ashley, I think that's a perfect example of reframing. Uh, she said reframing failure is so helpful. Why is this happening for me? And that's, I think that's the point to try to take it and turn it into something positive for sure. Yeah. I, I'll say one quick thing too, with, with what Ashley has, or, you know, why is this happening for me instead of why is it happening to me? Right. For is kind of like a giving, right. You can embrace that. Um, I was watching, um, 
a, a podcast or a, uh, a video cast probably like I don't know, six or 12 months ago. And I was listening to this um, uh, CEO talk and he's kind of a, a brash CEO, but whenever somebody would bring like negative news to him, his first response would be like, good. And like, that's just a frame of mind that he was putting himself in. Like whenever something bad was being brought to him, again, none of this stuff was catastrophic, but some of this stuff was somewhat, you know, um, you know, impactful on the business. But I actually started doing that myself more just silently in my head that when something bad would happen, I'd be like, good. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Even those small reframings of bad things happening um, where you can almost just like instantaneous reframe it, like get in the mindset. Okay, good. That just happened. Now, how do I take advantage of it? Um, you know, and certainly there's going to be, there's going to be some circumstances where it might be really, really hard to do that. But um, <laughs> for a lot of the minor things that we're talking about here, um, that reframing really does make a big difference. Get you in the right mindset. Yeah, I totally. I, I think you're absolutely right for sure. So I want to jump in and say something about the risk averse. Um, you know, the thing is that, you know, the company culture, I'm, I'm a big believer of culture, and, but the culture is not coming like vision statements or mission statements. It's not about, you know, hiring couple of consultants and, you know, joining two days sessions, jumping around and saying we are so happy. It's like your everyday, you know, actions. And then, you know, and I, as a company founder or the team member or the team leader, you know, you don't need to be a founder to do this, but if somebody falls and then if you say, oh, let's learn from it and let's, uh, you know, continue our life, you know, this is great. We failed. Let's, you know, uh, this is what we learned and let's, you know, go to the next thing. If you act like that, the people with the risk averse people will say, wow, you know, in this organization, in this culture is, you know, we learn from our failures so I can do stuff. I don't need to be scared about like somebody will punish me or somebody will look at me and say, oh, he failed, you know, there's no way that he can be a vice president or this and that. You know, if you take it out of from the culture and you are serious about it with your actions, you know, risk averse people will some come and saying, you know, I will do some, you know, uh, you know, activities there. I will do some execution. And if I fail, that's fine. And I think if we create cultures like that, you know, even the risk averse people will be, you know, uh, execute without the fear of failure. So. Mm -hmm. But I also think there, there's a cultural thing, certainly that I tell people when working around me that, and this is a personal thing, but when you come to me with a risk averse pushback, I'm going to get mad at you. You need to give me about five minutes. I'll think about it, then come back and talk to you. That's our culture. And I, I don't want to hear it in the moment, but I know I need to hear it, you know? So I totally, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's interesting but it's why people are risk averse. And I think that that leads me to my, my next question. And I think it goes to the, uh, the concept of culture, but you know, there, there, when failure comes inevitably the blame game starts. And I think that, uh, especially in certain cultures that I've worked in, um, where people, you can tell when you start a project and people know that it's going to fail and they immediately start the blame game. They start to figure out who they're going to push under the bus when this thing goes south. Um, and, and I think that it's uh, that that's a dangerous thing as well. Looking at different different kinds, there's there's a spectrum of failures that goes from everywhere from from blameworthy to praiseworthy. And it depends, again, on, on the perspective through which you view the lens through which you're viewing the failure itself. Um, and, 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 and who takes the blame and why, you know, so talk a little bit about that concept, Chris, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, that's, uh, the blame game is, you know, I, I suppose it's potentially human nature. What was the cause of this? Who, where, who, who, you know, but, um, it's, I think it's just absolutely critical to, you know, to take ownership for your failures publicly or, uh, you know, or just internally or both, frankly, you know, some of the failures, it's just going to be you, you, you know, yeah. you failed and no one, you know, it's a personal thing then, and then you have to take a step back and go, what was that? Uh, that was, that was this. Uh, and, um, and, you know, maybe you are the cause of that. So why, you know, and, and how, how do you address that? Um, but, you know, the, 
finding someone to blame and, and pushing that off, um, throwing under the bus for whatever, you know, when that happens, I mean, that's, that's sort of a, I mean, that's, I would fire somebody for something, you know, for that kind of behavior. And, well, you uh, can't learn from it if you're worried about blaming somebody else for it, right? You can't right. learn from it unless you've taken some bit of ownership for it. You, you have to. And uh, once that culture, once that's an accepted culture, cultural uh, action or be, uh, behavior, it becomes the way that's that in, that builds fear. And so people begin to be afraid of, fail, of failing immediately if that isn't, you know, rectified, you know, and uh, and so um, people should be inspired. And, and and Colin said this before, and I've worked with him, so I know <laughs> that he inspires uh, a culture that allows you to fail without the fear that someone's going to, you know, shove you under a bus and and uh, and, and learn uh, from that failure. So. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about that, Gian, that, that sort of blame, that blame game piece. Uh, you know, the, the thing is that with the blame game is, you know, the thing is that if we take, you know, like failures, personalize it, and then it makes it like, you know, and if we vilify it, then people will try to escape from it. And that's the, it, again, it comes to the culture. It, it comes to the, like as the leaders or the founders, like, you know, you know, like this is not about, again, the founder, like you can be a, you know, a leader of, you know, two people and, or you are the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the mailman in the mail room. But the thing is that if you, you know, if you make a mistake and if you try to find people to pin that on and, you know, and then when you grow up in the organization and if you continue that, you know, attitude, and that's will really the attitude of everybody because people will say, okay, you know, he never takes responsibility on anything. He he never fails. He because that's what we do in organizations. We wear these masks, and you know, these masks. You know, we say, I'm unfollowable. I'm you know, uh, I cannot fail. I cannot do this. So, and the reality of life is, you don't. You fail. You make mistakes. You know, and that's the reason. You know, if something is you know, conflicts with your current mask, you know, you will blame. And then you will find another person to pin it. The problem with that is now the people are more, car you know, carried away with the idea that who will they pin the blame on? Nobody looks at the real cause of this failure and and try to fix it. And it comes to the always the you know the you know the leadership and the culture. Like if if you're a leader and say, and uh, you know, like you know, this happened to me several years ago. Like I I was supposed to get this you know plane ticket for some client. I totally, it was late at night. I totally, instead of getting it next day, I, to, I bought the ticket next week. And so the pe person went to the airport and, you know, the ticket is not there. And then the next day we had this, you know, meeting. And I said, you know, guys, this is totally my mistake. I totally fucked it up. You know, I shouldn't buy tickets, you know, 2 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, and, but I think that, you know, that's a simple example. But the thing is that if everybody does that, then the people look at you and say, you know, if leadership accepts, you know, uh, failure and work with it and, you know, and they're not trying to blame it, that's, you know, my mistake, my error, I have the guts to do it. And then your culture will flourish and the people will not, people will stop blaming and then they start working on the failures and then the organization will go uh, further and versus it will turn into a nasty organization that people blames each other and it will create this and I call them pseudo communities like this is like, you know, people is, you know, very pleasant with one another, but avoid all disagreement. And, you know, people want to be loving and but they hold the truth about themselves. And so they avoid conflict. But whenever they find the right position, they come and hit you and they throw you under the bus. And, you know, the question here is, you know, in our organizations, we, do we need to have, have pseudo communities or we like to move to the true communities where people say, I failed, I take responsibility, I'm here, I don't have a mask, I'm courageous enough. And uh, if we go to true communities in our organizations, I think, uh, you know, uh, we'll have very successful lives and, and we don't need to burn out. And, and then the failures will be learning experiences continuously. Um, thank you. Colin, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. In our limited time together, uh, I've I enjoyed talking to you. Uh, you seem like somebody I would like to work for. 
uh, I'm actually giving everything up to come work for you. I hope you have a job for me. Um, <laughs> yep, but, the check already in the mail. Excellent. Talk <laughs> about, uh, especially I think you're in a unique position maybe um, to refer to or to, to talk a little bit about how, what your company's sort of cultural philosophy is when it comes to failure your own and people that work around you. And I think we would probably after even this short conversation, be able to guess, but it'd be nice to hear you kind of articulate that philosophy a little bit. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'll be pretty quick and succinct here. Um, the, you know, Agurian really came out of um, the me meeting, you know, Chris and Micah and then having, um, you know, childhood friends, Josh and Zach, who I was already doing work with. Um, we all had an entrepreneurial spirit, and wanted to, um, you know, create Agurian into the best of what a digital marketing agency could be. So from day one, we already had that entrepreneurial spirit. We set the tone around failure. Uh, luckily, we fell into EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. We, you know, adopted um, that wholeheartedly. We put in our core values. Those really haven't changed at all um, since we came up with them. And as our team has grown, um, we've tried to really make sure that the right people in the right seats that they felt like we always had their back, that they have the back of their teammates. And um, that in and of itself, um, just going into the company with that mindset and that belief and making sure that, you know, our team understands that failure is part of what we do and that there's this entrepreneurial spirit that exists and we're going to take chances. That has just really alleviated a lot of the issues that, um, you know, John was bringing up, um, you know, about what makes a bad culture. So, I'll stop there and really just and answer it that way pretty succinctly. And I would encourage all the people that are watching right now, you know, to, to whatever company you create, create it in the image in which you think is best to grow the company. You're the lead, your leadership, you're a founder. Um, at the end of the day, yes, you do need to take, you know, blame for failures within the organization. That's why it's important that you're living authentically, that the business is an authentic representation of you. Um, and and what you're trying to create. Thank you. Uh, Chris, what about you in the soon sober space in your kind of world? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's building something. I learned a lot about building a culture uh, when we built a Gurian, you know, as Colin mentioned, and, and uh, it's a, it's a, it, it's not an advertisement for a Gurian. It, it, it's just, it, it's a shiny example of, of what a culture should be. It really is. And, and that's something that's built from the, the people who are there make it, you know? And so um, a lot of that is, is where the, you know, the, the principles that we're building sober theory and, and soon sober, uh, that's where the, a lot of that is coming from. And it, ownership is a key part of that and making sure that there's accountability so that people so that people do understand when it's their responsibility because sometimes it's genuinely people don't know is this did i fail <laughs> who you know and that's why it's important to have that accountability and uh and clear communication and, and open openness in 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 the, in the culture because if that's not there sometimes um people just don't really know who's who is to blame if they're lo looking for someone and, uh, you know, and so it's important for us to have that in place. So you, you came coming from Agurian uh, and, and then moving into the sobriety space. I think you, you would agree that obviously that's two very different spaces, right? Uh, the sobriety space is much more personalized, much more emotional. I don't know. I'm not finding the right sort of nouns to describe it. But how do you see the that 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 sort of. How are you able to transfer the, the culture sort of deftly across those two very disparate spaces? That's a good question. Um, you know, I think that if your if it, it, values are important, and you know, Colin mentioned that, uh, and we've all talked about you know values, and it, those things can be in any organization. Those can be even those can be uh, something you live your life by or try to or aspire to, but they're really at the core, and it doesn't really matter what you do if those things are in place, right? And and if you know them and you're and you you're true to them and you're living true to those things, and so I think that's how we do how we're able to do that. Um, 
and it, and it actually shows how important they are because you can have values that can can really span across anything you do and you can bring those along with you and they evolve yeah. sometimes but yeah so the the name of the session is i failed what now right we talked about the fail let's take the last five minutes to talk about the what now how do you pick yourself up how do you dust yourself off how do you continue to move again we're not talking about the micro failures that Colin was talking about earlier. We're talking about those sort of catastrophic, the ones that get harder to deal with the older you get, uh, the ones that feel like they're shifting your DNA, the ones that, you know, those failures. Obviously, I've had several because I know them all very well. Um, but uh, sort of, and Gian, it sounds like you kind of had tough times um, in your past. So I think you would be... Uh, well equipped to sort of talk about that what do you how do you how have you picked yourself up over the last couple of years and dusted yourself off after your last big experience well you know the thing is that you know the the, the main there are several things i do like one thing is i find you know extremely impactful is being grateful like you know do not suck that what you couldn't do what you couldn't sell your company how your company failed what you couldn't get you know, concentrate on what you have. Like, if you have children, go hug your children and say, I have healthy children, I have a wonderful wife, I'm a warm house, you know, I, you know, I'm very grateful for that. You know, be, you know, like, understanding what you have and being grateful for it, it gives you this happiness. And then it takes you out of this, you know, world of like, I'm a loser, I'm lost, I do, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And then the second thing is never ask you question about like, why questions? Like, why did this happen to me? Why am I this? Why am I that? You know, ask what and how questions. Like, what happened and how can I, you know, uh, do better or what's next for me? And and then, you know, and then you go, uh, you know, uh, submerge yourself to, into relationships. Like, go, you know, talk to your friends. And, and, and then, you know, the next thing is, like, I'm a, you know, kind of an entrepreneur. I always look for, you know, next things. And I start looking around and say, uh, you know, uh, what is what is there out for me? What are my strengths and how can I implement them to, you know, uh, go to the next level? And and so I think if you, if I do those things, you know, I always, you know, uh, look forward and I always like, and then you define your failure or whatever as a, you know, you're a failure at the moment, maybe you can, you know, maybe you can call yourself. And, but at the same time, if you say it's at the moment, and now, you know, uh, you learn from it and now you are looking forward to it. And, and it takes you out of that psyche that, you know, like the founder's depression or that depression that, you know, sits on you and telling you that, you know, you're a failure, you cannot move, you are done, life is gone. And, uh, you know, life is continuing and, you know, uh, there's always, there's nothing late in life. You can always do things. And, and if you think about those things and being grateful and submerge yourself to some meaningful relationships, you know, it always works for me. And I always, you know, handle to, you know, move forward and, you know, uh, get going. Uh, well, we're almost at the end. Colin, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I would just hope, I know we've talked a lot about failure, but uh, really it's about, um, you know, the what, because, that's really what you want to focus your time on. Uh, really, ideally, people come away from this being a little bit inspired. Like, yeah, I failed, but you can read time and time again of all of these entrepreneurs that have found success, and very, very few of them did not also experience, you know, a catastrophic failure leading up to that success. Right. So, yeah. um, I think it's just really important that everybody continue to, you know, believe in yourself, try and feed yourself positive messages, be optimistic. Um, you know, certainly ask yourself the what and the how questions of, you know, why you failed. But at some point, you just have to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and, and move on. And the, the, the woe is me thing just, you know, isn't going to work. Um, you know, you can take a little bit of time to, to feel bad and feel down. But if you have a skill set, leverage that skill set. In the short term, it might mean getting a job. It doesn't mean that you can't still move and get your next endeavor up and running. So the main thing, stay optimistic, stay positive, and just keep moving if it's small daily increments. Chris, a message? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's just important to, to have, you know, it's like have hope, faith. There's some things about that, you know. Uh, it's being optimistic. 
you're 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 doing this for a reason and you got to have the you know the next one maybe that one that doesn't fail and it's just it's it's the golden uh you know dream that you've you had you know that you've had this entire time and so you have to have you have to continue to look internally but also if i just stop now that is the ultimate catastrophic <laughs> yeah and uh, and so what do i do now how do i what's the next thing that's all i'll add that's all I'll add for now. We're about 20 seconds out here. So. I know. Uh, so thank you guys very much for participating. I just want to add, um, I, I believe in the supposition that you have to embrace the concept of failure um, and embrace the role it can play in your process. Stop fearing it um, and treat it as a necessary and, and unavoidable speed bump on your road to ultimate success. And I think it's always about a paradigm shift. Um, I feel like in my career, I have always approached the question of I failed what now without a question mark, but with an explanation point. I'm excited about the next possibility. I failed. What now? Let's do it. You know, so I think if you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, embrace what happened, learn from it, surround yourself with wonderful people like I have today up there and over there and over there. All you guys are awesome. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, just keep moving forward. That's the dream, man. So thank you guys again. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Bye. Bye.